So Dirk, welcome. Um, let's just hear your voice as you greet us. I hope you would enjoy this platform today. Thank you, Johannes. I mean, uh, obviously, it's a, uh, such a great privilege to be with you and and just to share in this very important topic. So, yeah, let's let's see what wisdom comes from this discussion too. So let's thank you, Dirk. Let's start with you while you have the camera on. Uh, tell us about your passion and uh, background with children. Were you born like that or did God change something to give you that focus? Please just give us some background info. Yeah, I, I think I was born as a child, so that helped. Um, but Johannes, now I think uh, I'm still a child and I th even that helps because, I, you know, for me, I have a very good memory uh, not for facts, so, you know, names and faces and, and date, dates and things I can forget, but but experiences as a child. I can remember that. And that's why I, I can relate to children and what they go through, even though I have not been to, through, you know, anything near what, what the children that we encounter, uh, what they are going through or what they have been through. So in my ministry, uh, I saw, you know, these children in the, in the farm, in farm communities and how how they are so resilient and so suffering, suffering so much. So I saw both of those sides and I, I tried to understand where does God fit into their lives. And then when we joined Petra, obviously this is our focus. So, you know, I'm, I'm children, I, I, I just think and dream and pray and, and, and uh, uh, you know, talk to children all the time. And I've seen that, it's, it's an amazing um, testimony and challenge to all of us. I will move to the next question for Dirk. Let me just get it here. Uh, Dirk, the key, one of the key terms in our topic today is being wounded. Would you just explain to us what does that mean for you? How, how would we recognize when a child is wounded? Yeah. Um, um, woundedness, I think, is, uh, is, a, is in this case, it is a holistic term. Um, and we're thinking of the emotional woundedness. Yeah, okay, so for me, you know, the, the, the whole picture, so it can be physical wounds, and, it, and often it starts where it's related to physical wounds. But um, the glasses that I put on when I look at children going through rough times or ha who have been through rough experiences is, is the glasses of, of relationships. Um, because very often wounds are caused in relationships by relationship through relationships uh, and and i think you know a, a, a wound means that my image i i'm made in the in the image of god and god is a relational god and if a child made in the image of god experiences hurt in relationships that is a deep wound because it, it, it cuts to the essence of that child and, you know so for me seeing the child through the through the lens of, of um, relationships and see wound, seeing wounds through the lens of, of relationship uh, maybe it helps me to, to, to understand a little bit of what is really going on here it's an attack on the image of God which is uh, experienced as a deep deep pain what what we hear Dirk is that um, it is primarily emotional or at least that is where the deep hurt is and hurt is and that it occurs in relationship and yeah emotional that, existential spiritual i think you know all those sides is 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 as a human being you are in pain because of the attack on your on 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 who you really are and thank you Taryn will combine the first two questions. Derek has already responded. So uh, please share with us just the origins of your focus on children and especially wounded children. And then just help us with your understanding. Is this a term that you use or do you have another term that you just agreed that just explain to us what does woundedness mean for you when we deal with children? Thank you so much. Yes, um, I love, I'm going to just start um, on commenting on what Dirk said, just because I feel like it's a, it's a, it's so important and I don't want to lose that thought. I think it's so important, the lens with which we view wounding or hurt or brokenness is another word, um, and the way we view children. And a lot of um, 
my passion for working with children comes down to the fact that children don't exist in isolation, they exist within families. And I really believe that when we work with children, we work with families and we work with communities. And so there's a key in working with children to actually see communities changed and see generations changed and reached. And so that that's what the it boils down to. I, I was thinking about it today and I, I've I've wanted to work with children since I was six years old, <laughs> which is such an arbitrary concept, but I loved being a child. And I had some interaction with someone who was doing play therapy and saw their impact on family members that were of mine. And I had the opportunity to see their playroom and experience just one play therapy session. And I was blown away by this. Um, and I loved the freedom that it brought. And so I feel like one of the things that I really hope for in working with children is to see children free, set free, um, and to see families feel freedom. And it comes back to that idea of, of relationship. And I, I love it. Thank you, Dirk, because it just adds to almost what I was going to say in terms of my perspective or my lens is I don't often use the term wounded child or um, broken child. I really don't like the broken. Wounded we're good with, but um, I, I find that often when people are seeking help for their wounds, for their hurt, for their brokenness, um, we think of ourselves as broken and we can look at children and, and see a broken image. And I feel like that um, can cloud the way that we work with them. And so when working with wounded or hurt children, so anyone who's gone through, any child who's gone through a traumatic or stressful life event or relational breakdown, abuse, neglect, um, I like to actually think of it in terms of unmet needs or inappropriately met needs. So children who are wounded or children that have basic human needs and they, I'm not even thinking of food and clothes and all of that. I'm thinking of the need to be seen and heard and the need to be connected and the need to have a sense of, of power and control or, um, at the, in our world, which can sound quite controversial, but we can't act in control if we feel out of control. And um, yeah, just a, there are whole, so many needs that when those needs aren't appropriately met or they're inappropriately met, that's a different thing, then it can lead to wounding that affects our functioning. So a wounded child is a child whose functioning is affected to the point that they're not coping and they're not functioning well. And so my focus would always be on what are the needs that are unmet and how can we work to meet those needs. Thanks, Darren. So what we hear is that uh, wounded or hurt or any negative label would not be helpful in our engagement with children. So although you, you would rather speak about unmet needs or inappropriately met needs so that we don't label the child and then already start with, with uh, talking down or relating as though we're dealing with a category and we might miss. So we hear that caution. While we have the microphone and the cameras rolling and running the risk that you might suddenly disappear, so I'm going to give you the next one straight away. Why play? And, and, and what does that mean to you? Are we not supposed to grow up at some point and give the kids something serious to work with? <laughs> um, something serious to work with is play. We're going to start there. <laughs> you can see we've got a little bit sass in us, so <laughs> please excuse that. No, I am so passionate about play that if um, it's it's so funny because there's a, a quote around play and how important it is to children that speaks of how we as adults often view it as frivolous nonsense, essentially. And at the end of the day, when we look at play for what it means to children and us as adults, <laughs> I will be so bold as to say, play is serious business. It, it's the work of childhood is one of the, the phrases that are used to describe play in childhood. And it comes down to the fact, so there's research that supports the fact that play is very good for learning and for development and growth. And it shows how when we um, are trying to learn a new skill and coping skills in our healing process aren't any different to that we are able we as humans not just children are able to retain that information and learn that skill better under playful circumstances than under forced serious circumstances um, and it, when it comes to play for children 
it's something that comes naturally to them. You don't have to teach a child to play. They don't have to have toys to play. Um, they don't, it doesn't have to be instructed play. Children will make a plan to play no matter where they are and what circumstances they're under. And they play from when, from when they come out, like in their engagement with their caregivers' faces, they're learning how to play uh, or they're engaging playfully. So we see playful engagement from, from the outset and even to an, into adulthood. I'll get to that in a moment. And um, so play, first of all, comes naturally. And children don't have necessarily all the array of communication skills that we have taken years and years to develop and still don't get right. And so they might not always be able to communicate their feelings or their experiences or process their experiences verbally or cognitively in the way that we are able to as adults and sometimes are not able to successfully as adults. And so play just gives them that space to be able to process their worlds naturally and without threat. So that's the really important thing when working with children who've experienced wounding and hurt is that often our hurt, if we need to process it in our minds in a very like literal con cognitive sense, then we run the risk of re-experiencing that trauma in a way that we're not fully equipped to deal with it and heal from it. But when a child engages with their, their world, their experience, and they process their world, which children will naturally do through play, they're able to remove themselves from it while they process it. It's able to be something outside of themselves that then they can actually find their healing in a way that they don't have to relive the trauma or relive the wounding process. But at the end of the experience, they get to take full ownership of the healing and the growth and the discovery that they've made through the playing process. So that's what I, I mean by without threat is it's far enough away from us that we don't have to be, be or feel threatened so that we can actually deal with life and process and things that are going on in our world and our feelings and our experiences. And we can play with ideas and leave on the table or the play floor <laughs> what is not for us and we get to take what is for us. Um, so another thing I, I often, because I work with children and our children are exposed to so much from the external world that we would prefer, especially as Christian families, that they not be exposed to, but sometimes it's unavoidable. There's a lot that, that will mull in children's minds that is not actually welcome there, that threatens the innocence and they don't want it there just as much as we don't want it there, but it needs to come out. <laughs> so play is a really good way that children can get that stuff out and not have to take ownership of it for themselves, but leave it on the floor, <laughs> leave it in the play. And so I think sometimes as adults, we also get scared when we see things played out in our children's play or we see violent play. But I honestly get quite excited because it's in the child's mind. It's something they need to get out. And if they're able to play it out and leave it, <laughs> they can keep what's of the, like keep the innocence and they can keep their childhood and they can keep what, you know, God has in store for them to keep actually. So play is very serious. <laughs> it's how mm. children make sense of their worlds. It how, it's how they process their worlds. It's how they learn and develop and grow. And as adults, we have different forms of play that we engage in whether it's through hobbies or socializing. <laughs> um, we have our playful recreational spaces as well that serve to meet a very important need for us as for us too. So play is serious and it's important. <laughs> Thank you so much, Taryn. It's, it's what a privilege to meet someone who's done all her half her childhood and all a professional focus around play. It, it yeah, what, what's, sticks with me is just your summary that play is the way that children naturally process their world. So, so it, it would take me a few weeks to unpack that. Of course, we agree. Dirk, you've also said a lot and taught a lot and done a lot in play. You're welcome to just latch on to what you heard from Taryn, but we want, would like to know what other skills do you, maybe one or two because of time limits, but what do you what other skills are there to help children um, process their worlds, as Taran said? 
Okay, I, I maybe just one comment there, and I just so fully agree with everything you said. Um, and, and maybe in my own mind again, uh, if I bring it back to the image of God, uh, for me, you know, God is a storyteller. Uh, it's part of his, God's image. Uh, and and uh, storytelling and play, uh, they are linked. So, so play is a form of storytelling. And storytelling is a, is a form of play. So when children play, they actually play in the image of God, who is a storyteller and who is play playful. So for me, you know, this, there are some deep, deep, deep things that I really love, and I think you ex you, you explained it very well. Um, Johannes, uh, when it comes to skills, um, you know, I always want to start asking the question, um, what are the values that, that are needed? You know, because the skills can be something that you can do just superficially, but, but skills, they have to serve values. And, th and that's for me the most important thing. So for me, you know, this deep, deep value of like somebody like Taryn, she would sit with a child and then she would empty herself of herself. To a certain extent because she has to be be there with the child okay Taryn let me not put you on the spot here I'm just saying so the, the whole idea is that I'm there as as being completely present with the child deeply respectful deeply humble just just being there and and, and discovering with the child where are we actually going and where are you taking me and, and, and how can I follow? So, the, you know, the, the, the whole concept of walking with, unfortunately, you know, often people, they, they miss, you know, it's a nice alliteration, walking with wounded, and then they focus on the wounded side. But, but I would rather have them focus on the walking with side because that's the issue there. How do I walk with a child that went through something that is too horrible to contemplate? Um, so that's that, that's my my attitude is i'm here i'm with you i'm going to be humble and then of course there are skills that are linked to this and the, the foundational skill is listening you know everything starts with listening everything starts with listening uh paul tillich i mean i i love his quote that he says the the first task or the first duty of love is to listen so, so uh, when I'm with a child, my first duty is to listen. And I, I listen with my complete senses, all my senses, my ears, my eyes, my, my, just my, my tasting, tasting what is going on here. So, and then I think, I think then uh, Taryn already explained, there are certain ways in which you can allow the child just to communicate, just to share, just to open his, his heart, just to put into a, a box uh, or into toys, things that are going through his own heart. And some of these things are very emotional. So it, they don't need to mean something to me or to him, but it's just emotions linked to this. The words, the, the toys, they are words, they have meaning. So how to use those toys, how to allow the child to use all the different means, those are also skills. How to ask the right questions, and I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm very allergic to questions, but at the right times, how to ask the right questions. Those are the kinds of skills. Um, and then, of course, how to show the child, I'm, I'm with you, how to, how to sit down, how to face the child, how to just how to interact in, in a way that will create complete safety, complete safety for the child. Because if he starts to open up and put his things on, on the floor, as Darren said, he needs to feel safe. Otherwise, he is just being abused again. Okay, that's, that's a mouthful. I'll just run through it. So uh, you, you started by saying emptying myself so to communicate that I value the child. So I give my time, I get to the level. So um, I enter, in a sense, the world, the reality of the child. And then you said I must listen because that's the language of love. And then you say, if necessary, one or two questions at the right point, but carefully asked. Maybe you can just help us a bit more because we might miss the question side or just the, the talking. Uh, Taryn, we're coming to you now for advice for parents. But Derek, just on this point, please, just on that, the talk or the question, please. Yeah. Uh, um, um, the danger with us as adults is we think information will serve us. If we have enough information, then we can start solving the problem. So, so we are in the wrong, it's a completely wrong mindset. 
you know, information is not the issue here. So when I ask questions, we, we tend, we are, we are always tempted to ask information questions. Um, and, and those are the ones that, that are not really helpful. Because who wants this information? And what do, you know, who wants to take control here? If I ask information questions, I'm starting, I'm taking control. And that doesn't help the relationship. What helps the relationship, if I do ask questions, is I really want to understand you better. I really want to, to see how do you see life? How do you, you see things? What does it look like from your side? So, so I'm, I might not ask the questions in the way that I'm asking them now, but this is basically what's behind it. It's, it's a deeper understanding of, a bit, it's, a, it's a desire to have a deeper understanding of who are you? Where are you? How do you see life? What are you dealing with? Because I want to walk with you. Maybe it doesn't help, but I think it's more the attitude no, it rather does, than it the... Does. So what, what, what you say is those type of questions are invitations to the child in a safe space to open up slightly more. So is that the caution you talk about? Absolutely. And that's why I, that's why I say I'm actually allergic to questions because people just so quickly slip into the sort of you know, interview questionnaire kind of, of, of style. And, and, and I, I, I don't see this as helpful. Thank you so much. And for our audience, you would be welcomed in 10 minutes or so, maybe 12, to um, type, type a question if you have that for Dirk or for Taryn. So that's what we have it for. Uh, we'd love you to have the opportunity to, to ask one or two questions and we would distribute the questions among our two um, respected guests. Taryn, uh, parenting. So. I would assume it could, could go two ways. Some parents always play and some never play. So you have a lot of parents and grandparents in the audience. If you break it down and make it very simple, uh, how would we know that we're really playing in the right way with our children? And what advice would you give us as parents or grandparents to, to help us to play in the right way? What a great question. Um, I'll start with this idea that children are the experts on play. <laughs> so don't listen to me, listen to your child. <laughs> um, and goodbye, I'm joking. Um, but <laughs> genuinely, children are the experts on play. They know what they need to get done in their play. And like Dirk said, it might not always look like what we're after. It might not just be giving us information. I think people, when they think specifically of play therapy, they think that I'll sit down with a child, give them an activity, and then I'll know absolutely everything. And that's information is not the goal. Being present is the goal. And so if you can somehow carve out, it doesn't need to be a lot of time, time where you are device and distraction free, where you are giving your child or your grandchild or whoever this child is in your life um, your attention and following their lead in play, um, you've, you're doing it right. <laughs> you've won. You've ticked the box. Um, but just being present, listening to what it is they want you to do and following, following their play, however scary it might be because we like order and control and we like things to be ordered and in control and Dirk made a really good point that if we approach children's play that in from a point where we are the ones in control and we are the powerful ones we've missed the point and it probably they can be playing with lego or doing something that we think is play but if we've instructed it and directed it it's not play in its truest sense so we just want to give them the place to do what they need to do and just be present and one of this i like to um give very simple advice to parents being a parent myself when you're in the thick of it and when we're dealing with hard things in parenting and in life we don't have the brain capacity to now sort through all the theory and apply all the beautiful skills so it needs to be simple for me <laughs> and i hope that um the parents that i work with are also people that it needs to be simple for um so the first piece of advice is i give is when you're playing with a child or interacting with a child or just being being there with a child and you don't know what to say or do <laughs> say what you see and say what you hear and it it feels awkward it literally is i'm going to give an example now because i'm sitting in my my play therapy office or my playroom that, that's actually what we call it <laughs> and i'm looking out the window at beautiful trees and i see some palm trees blowing in the wind 
I've given no value judgment. I've not made a deep assessment about it. I've done nothing else but just let all of you know what I can see in front of me. And I can hear something bubbling. I'm actually not sure what that is, but <laughs> we're not worrying about that right now. But we can do the same with, with our children. So I see Dirk put his hand on his mouth. I'm so sorry to put you on the, on the spot, but I feel like so, you're someone that can, that can handle that with the, <laughs> handle the stage well. Um, but we can literally just say those things and we're letting, it's awkward in the beginning, but we're letting the person in front of us know, the person, not just the child, we can practice it amongst ourselves, that we see them and they're worthy of being seen without it needing to be something exceptional or great or terrible. Um, so one of our basic needs, again, coming back to this idea of needs, is my parenting advice or advice for parents always comes down to how do we meet needs better? And there's some things that are cross applicable. And one of those needs is to be seen and accepted and to be good enough in as boring or as ordinary a state we are so that we don't need to live up to this empty praise of being amazing and wonderful and exceptional but we also don't have to live up to being the bad child um, we can just be who we are as we are and so say what you see and say what you hear if you don't know what else to do because that's meeting the need to be seen and heard in exactly as we are we don't need to be anything exceptional to be seen or heard um, another key need is this need to um, feel like we have our feet on the ground. Um, I remember when I gave my life to Jesus, when I committed my life to Jesus and actually my life changed, the feeling that set in my heart was my feet feel like they are firmly on the ground for the first time in my life. And I always come back to that is that Jesus puts my, plants my feet firmly on the ground. And that is the sense of power and control. It's the sense of I can feel the ground under my feet and I don't feel completely out of control, even when everything around me is out of control. And one way to meet this need, um, another simple, <laughs> simple, but not always easy um, thing is just by giving choice. The, one of the greatest gifts I believe against, again, I'm not a theologian, <laughs> so, and we're among some very wise minds in the theology sphere, so please excuse me, <laughs> but, um, I believe that one of the greatest gifts that God gave us was our free will because it gives us the capacity to choose Jesus. Um, and hello, <laughs> is that not the best thing in the whole world? And so free will, it comes down to that. It comes down to the fact that we don't always have a choice about what we do, but we have a choice. We can give children a choice in how they do something. So the wounded child or a child that's living in a space of wounding probably feels out of control. And the way that we can empower them or give them back that sense of control is by giving them small, easy, simple choices in life. Do you want a blue plate or a red plate? Do you want to walk to the bath or hop to the bath? Um, honestly, the simplest thing is just to help them realize that they can have their feet firmly planted on the ground. And then, sorry, a third thing. So our first thing is we just say what we see, we, we say what we hear. We give choice to give power back. And the third um, one is just all feelings are okay. It's what we do with them that um, sometimes crosses the boundary of not okay and okay. And so again, back to the say what you see and say what you hear, you might not always have the answers. You, it's not our job as parents and grandparents to always fix it. It's our problem to walk with our children, to be there with them in the pain and walk the journey with them so that we can empower them to be capable adults who can walk that journey again. And so by saying what we see in terms, when we see a feeling come up, we name that feeling and we let them know it's okay. You're talking to myself right now. We can practice the skill with ourselves. I'm scared and it's okay to be scared because scared lets me know to be careful. And right now I'm scared because I'm talking to a whole bunch of people and it makes me nervous, but I'm bringing it down to the simplistic feeling of scared and it's good. It's okay. It lets me know to be careful. It's hopefully getting me to talk a bit slower because I talk fast when I'm nervous. Um, but yeah, this is a basic skill that we can practice with ourselves and our children to let them know that their experience is valid. Like we don't, we experience feelings and that's 
good that's okay that's healthy and then we can move on to what we do with those feelings so that's <laughs> it thank you so time. much Turn when you speak there's often a moment that i wish i can freeze it to drink it in um, so just your statement that the child is the expert so i'm going to give dirk a real life question and so that you can just relax and and help me evaluate his excellent answer so dirk um, we have a few children and when the youngest one was very small Whenever I would play with her or be there, it was very important for her to take control of the game. Now, I'm supposed to be the father and in some set, settings, you know, a person respected as a pastor and as a leader. So it doesn't always come naturally. But even as a grown up, it's very important for her to control the play. So just explain to us, you can use my story to just uh, evaluate and explain what's happening there in line with what Terence says, the child is the expert. Yeah, yeah, sure. There are so many things, uh, beautiful things that Terence also said, but I think uh, let's pick it up from what, what, uh, Terence, where she said, how do you as a parent just express what you see and what you experience? Um, uh, because this that's the first thing to say um i, I you know you are trying uh, you are trying to to wrestle me to the ground or you're trying to do this i just observe this um and uh, um so that she can be aware of what you see what you experience so that's the first thing and then you might try to see uh, you know or try to understand what's behind it I, I, it's, anyway, I'm, 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 I'm on a sort of slippery ground now here because it's not so much of trying to understand what's behind it, but but who are you um, in a positive way? Who are you, my little girl who is, who is playing these games with me uh, with a specific purpose in mind? Um, so I do want to understand who you are, but you also have to understand who I am. And not in so much in the term of, uh, in terms of, I'm your father, I'm the bigger one, I'm the stronger one, you should uh, obey me. But I am the second one in this relationship. There are two people in this relationship. And what does a re relationship look like? So I can, I also want to be completely transparent about my experience of this relationship at the moment, as you are you expressing yourself in maybe a way that's, that, that I experience is very negative. So, you know, for me, the growth comes when she understands there's two sides to a relationship or five sides or 20 sides, depending on the size of the group. And everybody should be respected, not only the one. Everybody should be respected as a full human being. OK, so Johannes, that means there comes a point where you say, I, I'm putting myself in your shoes. I'm trying to understand you, but I also want you to understand me. I'm, uh, I'm willing to allow you many things, but there will be boundaries where you are actually now starting to uh, disrespect my, my humanness. And, and, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just going to show you that I, I, want, I cannot allow that because then you are going to start destroying, uh, you know, the respect for all people. So uh, we're talking for philosophy here, but, but I think you understand the concept is that I am with you. I'm walking with you. I'm walking with you through your struggles. Your struggles will sometimes hurt me, but I'll be absolutely open with you. Very accepting, completely accepting, but also very transparent so that you can also learn how, how do other people feel. That's maturity. Thank you so much, Dirk. And I see some guys are typing. So Taryn, there's a question for you from Candida. Dr. Muller, she says, Dear Taryn, it's lovely to hear your recommendation to center the child as the expert in the play space. It's a relief to many of us. May I please ask you what advice can you share with pastors and adults in showing children that they are seen, appreciated, and valuable in the church? Love that question. Thank you so much, Candida. I wish I had a perfect answer for this question, and I don't. Um, I think what it comes down to for me is making sure that there is a, a safe space in the church environment where children can be free to express themselves. Um, children will naturally be louder and be more boisterous, even, the, I mean, some children are quieter, but where children can freely express themselves and be children. I think, <laughs> yeah, if we manage to create a space 
that welcomes children like Jesus welcomed the children in a church space um, within the boundaries. So I think that when it comes to navigating what that looks like in your specific church space, I think understanding what are the boundaries that are important for us in this in this space and what are our non-negotiables and within the safety net of that how do we create a space that allows children to be children without just asking them to be quiet so adults can experience jesus <laughs> so <laughs> i think that sometimes there's a risky space of that of we're quieting children quietening children too much so that adults can be present for the teaching that we're actually teaching children that they are not ready or worthy of knowing of having that space where they can also connect to the lord so i think just yeah having keeping things playful is also helpful and not being too worried if things don't look perfect <laughs> um, and they don't get it right away because i've seen just in my two-year-old's life just being in a place that is very play focused um, in terms of a church space, he comes back with so much about with like that he's actually learned from kids church that I know he's learned from kids church because he hasn't learned it from me. And I'm so blown away because from the outside in, it just looks like they're playing and have a story and sing a few songs. But then my two, year, two and a half year old is looking at the trees in the garden with me and telling me that God made them. <laughs> And I think, oh, I really should have mentioned that, <laughs> but I didn't. <laughs> um, but good thing we have a community around us. Um, so I think just keeping it fun, keeping it age appropriate and trusting and, and keeping it safe where children can feel free to be themselves and trusting that, that God is actually big enough to also do the rest. Um, that would I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Timba, I'm just going to hold your question a while so that Taryn can relax. So, Dirk, I'm channeling Cornelia's question to you. What are some physical signs of unmet needs to look out for in your child? We reserve for later the question of how do we know when we need to refer the child for some yeah. um, specialist uh, place? So this is just normal family church relations. So she asks, are there physical signs that the needs are unmet? Sure. Uh, Johannes, yes, uh, there, there are physical signs, but children uh, are also, especially if they live in fear, they will try to hide everything as much as they can. They will try to act as normal as, as they can. And sometimes they can slip under the radar by just being this very obedient, very nice child. And, 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 and we appreciate it. So, so I mean, sometimes, you know, you must, we must just be aware that children can actually hide certain things. But if you are in a close relationship with children, then certain things will, will start pointing, uh, pointing out. One of the things that you would often see is regression in some form that the child, child will either regress in terms of behavior, like, you know, in reasons, the incubreses, those kinds of things, bedwetting, which, which is inappropriate for the age. It's, it's appropriate for, for a younger age. Or uh, crying that is inappropriate for that age, or clinging that's inappropriate for that age. So, so that's one of the, the, the things that, that sometimes can point out, uh, this child is not really acting the age that she should act, and there could, can be a thousand reasons, but let me just open my eyes and see what's going on here. I think we often say sudden changes, sudden changes in sleeping patterns, sudden changes in, in eating patterns. So those are often very, uh, they can be indicators. Besides the, uh, the sort of the obvious physical things also, I'm not going to, to, to refer to them now. Thank you so much, Dirk. Taron, your turn this time. Uh, what when play becomes a distraction at the child is school going age wants to play all the time that's timba's question so you i can read it how do you assist the child that is too much on play and neglecting schoolwork okay that's a, a good question i'm assuming this refers to perhaps homework or if it's in the classroom if they are too distracted or too busy or too um, I'm going to use the word over or under stimulated that they're not able to focus on their schoolwork. Um, again, coming back to the idea of needs, we want to make sure, first of all, that there are no underlying unmet needs. And by that, I mean, if a, if a child is struggling, for example, in the classroom to pay attention and to focus and to get their work done, 
um, often a very simple um, or something to investigate rather, often something to investigate is whether perhaps their brain is being under or overstimulated or their bodies are being under or overstimulated. We all, this is not my field of expertise, but I learn a lot from the colleagues that I work with and something that I pick up and, and will encourage parents to investigate a bit more is this idea that we all have different sensory profiles and we all experience the world through our senses, but in different ways. And so some children from um, might have difficulty keeping still or focusing in a classroom space, for example, because they are understimulated and through their senses or overstimulated through their senses. And then the strategies are quite practical in terms of helping them concentrate. Um, and occupational therapists are great with this, but they, if we know the child well, there are things that we can implement like fidgets and um, weighted cushions it can help around a bedtime for, for some children. Some children we might also find are very seeking of physical input and physical behavior. And that also communicates a need for us related to their sensory needs. Um, so it, it obviously will depend on the specific child, but one thing to look out for is are they, is there maybe a sensory component to this or do we need to speak to someone who, who knows a bit more about that? Um, the other thing is school going age can be um, as young as preschool, or I'm thinking we're talking about primary school up, but children are quite young in the grade R, grade one, grade two, grade three space. And so it is actually developmentally appropriate for them to want to play more. And so um, it also just depends what we as adults are expecting from them. And maybe it's outside of what they're able, able to do. Homework is something I've got lots of thoughts on, but it's, it's something that we really push on children. And sometimes they aren't, it's not a developmentally appropriate for them to spend that much time on serious work. So ways that we might approach that is by making them more playful. It also depends on that child's specific needs as well. Children have, have different needs um, and have different ways that they take in information. So we really do need to look at it case by case. But um, in a general sense, we can look at how we can make that space a bit more playful and also make sure is the child getting enough outdoor time if that's possible and safe for them to get? Are they getting enough physical input because children really do have energy they need to burn off? And how can we safely allow for that so that they can also get their schoolwork done? Um, and are they, yeah, are they getting enough playtime, um, like intentional playtime? Or is our time being spent trying to steer them towards schoolwork the whole time. And it looks like they're playing the whole time, but actually we're just in this juggle with them and no one's winning <laughs> actually. So there are a lot of different layers to look at in terms of that, um, but get, um, simple advice. Let's take it back to the simple. I read something once that's really stuck with me and I've seen it to be true, is that if a child's not doing, like not coping, so not being able to focus or do what they need, need to do, take them outside or put them in water. <laughs> so um, very simply, or drink water, that can be very regulating as well. So having a cold or hot drink, having a bath or going outside for 10 minutes can just reset a child's um, mind to be able to actually focus on the things that we expect from them. I hope that does answer. Thank you. And for our friends, thank you for the questions that are coming. Um, I, Candace, I assume you feel that yours have been has been addressed. Um, it looks like it from, from the response there. Uh, Taron, I'll come back after the, the next one. We we'll give him the heavy one now. But for you, uh, do we play different in a different way as Christians? Or to put the question in another way, when does Jesus join? your playroom. So so would you just give us an idea of, or do we just play as anyone else? So you can ever, I'll come back to that question. Dirk, uh, Richard Otiso uh, takes us to um, bigger trauma that affects a lot of children. I read his question to you is, is with refugees from the Ukraine, the ministers in, in Europe. Let me just get to the question now, just there. Uh, um, it's, it's a rather long one, but I think the question from your experience with with mass trauma that involves a lot of children in that setting. So normally you would say this is too specialized and an ordinary Christian worker cannot really deal with it, but that's not always practical. From your exposure to similar sad, tragic, massive 
situations. Just give us some clues. Um, if you need, uh, Brother Otisu, I think it's Dr. Otisu, can give us more detail, but maybe you hear where this question is going. Yeah. Um, Otisu, I, I, I just quickly scanned what you wrote there, and I should actually uh, read it much more carefully. The last sentence says, uh, kids only tell it clearly, and I sit and listen and feel hopeless and hopeless and speaking nothing except to sit and listen. Their pain becomes my pain. Um, is that the one you're referring to, Johannes? And, and I see, Richard, you also had some more comments on that. Um, I, can, I, I want to start with that by saying listening and listening is not being helpless. That is the help. And often that is the help that the child needs more than anything else. The child needs to tell his story to somebody who is willing to listen and who is strong enough not to be swamped or overcome by the story. So if you say, I will carry your story because it is too heavy for you to carry, I will help you carry it, even though I can do nothing about it. Okay, now that's for the individual child, but it can also apply to a whole group of children. It can, it can apply to a, a refugee camp full of children who come and say, we have a story. And maybe one or two or three of them will actually tell the story and the others will just say, yes, 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 all the time. They agree because it's their story. But the fact that they can tell it to one person coming from outside who have not been through that situation, who is just willing to listen and say, you can keep on talking. If we need to stay here another week, I will be here every day so that you can talk. That is not being helpless. That's being extremely helpful because now they can start making sense of things. They can start figuring it out. And, and, and maybe after a week, they will start asking you questions. How are we going to deal with this? Even if you don't know how, it's also okay because it's their process, but you, just you being there, listening to a group of children. And I, I mean, there are many skills that you can link to that, how to express themselves through toys or through drawings or through leaves and sticks and stones. How do they express? How do they tell their story? But, but your presence there, that's the, that's the main thing. You are absolutely not helpless. Thank you, Dirk. And can we press one level deeper? When the trauma, the wounds are so deep that the child cannot speak and you don't have the luxury of an expert, a professional person, just take us. So this is not what happened to you. God has given you those gifts, but talk to us who would, would feel less equipped to deal with these extreme situations. So my question is, um, someone said the real traumatized wounded child would be the one who avoids play and who cannot find the words or the toys to express the pain. Would you give us some guidance there, please? I'm still with you, Dirk, sorry. Um, and then we would go back to the playroom. You are muted. I thought it was Darren, sorry, sorry. I, I, that's what I was looking at. Um, uh, yeah, the whole thing of, of children that are so much, now, now children, they will express their pain and they might play in a way that it doesn't look like play. Because for us, play is a, is a, you know, is, is a a joyful thing or some you know children might look very serious when they play but even a child that has been deeply hurt let's say a child who has been sexually abused to a very deep level she has been she will play in ways that you might say this is extremely inappropriate um the way that she plays the, the way that she deals with 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 people with adults she would she might start playing with adults in a very inappropriate way but it's a way of trying to express something that is just completely overwhelming her. So, so the, so we should not we should not um, uh, underestimate you know the, the the size of play. Play can have many different forms. It's basically just expressing, expressing, expressing what's inside. I'm not sure whether I'm answering the question, but but I I just wanted to make that. that Thank point. you. Thank you, Doug. This is this is taking us. To... Darren, when does Jesus enter the playroom and do you welcome him or does he just join of his own? So, so how do we play as sons and daughters of God? That's such a good question. So I often say um, I have colleagues that also have relationship with Lord, the Lord and those are the people that I confide in and that we, we do supervision together because I often say that if 
there's no way to do this without Jesus. And so I'm not 100% sure how you work therapeutically with children or with people without Jesus, because I don't know what that looks like. I understand logically what the theory looks like, but we're dealing with whole people. Um, and in order to deal with whole people, we need to invite Jesus into that space. So I'm at, um, I, I feel like points to that are quite important is the power of prayer. We really have a space to stand and, and to pray for the people that we're working with. And I believe that that's often so much more powerful than anything we can do. Um, and then there's something about like, um, the father welcomes us with open arms and allowing people um, not just children but allowing people into our space knowing that it is a safe space um, a non-judgmental space and just witnessing them that i really do feel like shows um the father's heart and also just allows a space when we welcome him in for the lord to minister um i don't uh it's hard sometimes so i won't this i won't preach at children i don't feel like that is my role um but often um, this idea of needing a savior or needing help come, comes through and children often make that association with the Lord um, because he, <laughs> he is our help in time of need. And then we create a space for that. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky thing to answer, but it's also as simple as I couldn't do this without Jesus. I welcome him in and I consider prayer 90% of the work that I do. <laughs> um, and through that, I've seen how God brings healing and restoration and um, does what he needs to do. And I love it when I have the opportunity when I'm working with people and they bring they bring God into the conversation because then I feel like it opens that space for it to have a meaningful impact in their lives um, as opposed to, again, inserting that, power, that space of power and telling them, what needs what is right for their story i hope that makes sense so yeah we Thank don't, you. don't throw the bible you. at children but trust that god god is at the center of the work that we do yeah can can i maybe just add one sentence to mm -hmm. and, and, and taryn absolutely what you're saying but i think the other side is i realize that i represent jesus uh, so so and i think this is what you have been saying taryn I'm sitting there as Jesus. Now, don't don't get me wrong. He, he, I'm 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 the you know the physical appearance of the Spirit living inside me, and I am not alone. I have a, a cloud of witnesses that should be with me, and I would like to introduce this family who do not know Jesus. I would like to introduce them to the other people that are part of the body of Christ, because this is where they're actually going to meet Jesus. Be by me representing him and by the body also representing Jesus. So for me, this is a, it's a quite a vital um, aspect. Thank you so much. Uh, we now going to referring for professional help and what would signal to us that this is a situation that needs that type of response. So Dirk, um, it's a question raised by Lisa and by Nomonde, maybe someone else as well. Uh, how, what would signal to us that this is something that needs professional help or let me put it the same question another way, uh, by law and also by just the codes of um, social work and counseling work, there's certain things we're not supposed to do. So where are the boundaries between what we normally do in play and the response to a wounded child on the one hand and something that is not our place and that we should refer. So both of you will ask you to respond to that. That might help us to know. So Dirk, if you're ready, you can kick off and then Taryn, you would have the microphone to wrap it up and, and guide us. Thank you. Yes, I, I would I would love to leave some, uh, some of the more technical things to Taryn because I think you deal with it more often than I do. For me, I would, I would rather go, you know, start from the, from the attitude of the helper. Um, uh, I think um, uh, what Lisa referred to there are people who are not certified, you know, play therapists or therapists in, other, in, in some other way. So for me, the first thing is my attitude should always be the child is more important than I. So whatever the child needs is more important than I, what I need. And, and you know, we, we can be 
be so tempted a child will come to me and he says or in some way he indicates what i'm going to tell you i've never told anybody before you see the problem is this can this can give me an adrenaline kick and it can boost my ego because i think there's something special in me and i am now going to be the savior of this child i'm going to help this child the moment you go in that direction on the wrong track because it's not about my ego. it's about the e it's not the, it's the the need of the child so it might be very very soon i say i am the wrong person because i actually have the wrong attitude my attitude is i want to help you this is the wrong attitude um so very soon might have to give you uh, refer you to somebody that doesn't have the attitude of of an ego that must be served can you see i'm, I'm taking from that from that foundation johannes all right the second thing that i want to add is i uh, especially for people who are not in the profession but i think even professionals like Taryn, you uh, you are never alone you are always part of a bigger network you're always part of a team so the moment that there's something that you say this i know there's somebody that is better in this you know some kind of teaching then 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 you I, I i refer you to that team so i think in terms of a team not as a sole counselor and for me if you have that approach then it's it's almost like you very quickly start referring uh, especially if you feel you're uh, the child is, is uh, or you're in a field in a field where the child needs the help of other people who are more professional than you i, I this is not going coming to the technical side now it's, it's more like the attitude darren maybe you can add and we can have a discussion about this thank you so much dirk i'll definitely agree with that as we don't function in isolation and if we are functioning in isolation and being the so sole lone hero we need to surround ourselves by people because we don't save children actually we are not jesus we are his hands and feet and i might be this hand and someone else might be that hand <laughs> and we need to work we need to work with the body and work under care and supervision also to take care of ourselves i think that's so important is that um when we're walking into fire to get someone out we need to make sure that we've got protective gear and there's someone that's got our back to make sure that the child and we make it out alive and so having people around you in that can support you in a counseling team but also if something comes your way and you think oh i'm not sure if this is too big for me speak to someone who knows more we need those people in our life definitely um and take advice when it comes to technical legal aspects so one thing i'll just speak very straight to is according to the children's act if we suspect that a child has been or is being neglected or abused we have a legal obligation to report it to a social welfare organization or the police um, and it's not our job to decide whether it's actually happened or not happened um, but an investigation has to happen and it's uh, because it's a a criminal offense um that it needs to be to be reported so even if we aren't that child's parents if a child discloses abuse or neglect to us we have a legal obligation to report that so i just want one to note that thank you so absolutely much. yes sorry and I, so so i think for that's absolutely the, the, the whole point here as uh, and that's why if i go into this field i, I saw the question of candida also the children in the church context if i start working with children in this kind of role even as an, a sort of you know a, a non-professional i have to build my network with the police and with the social worker right from the beginning before the child arrives who reports abuse because I, I i have to have that network to say when the child comes and reports i know who to, to contact i already have a relationship they already know how did i get this information and and what is my role so for me it's it's like something right from the start built a, built a network um and in church context transparency transparency that's that's the main thing you know you, you, you open door you, you don't sit with a child in a, in a in a room with a closed door that's not for you that's not if, if you're not professional you don't do that uh, there must be transparencies so that there's complete safety um, and and there are ways to 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 help the child feel safe in, a, in an environment like that
Thank you, Taran and Dirk. Dirk, on this one, just uh, the church doesn't have a good track record in terms of vigilance reporting on child abuse. They are actually horrifying examples of the church hiding that. So what would your advice be to for us as, as pastors and leaders in this audience to not go the same way, to, to, to see and to do what Taran said? And if it's international, how does the reporting work when pastors know and don't talk or may be complicit? Yeah, well, I think uh, I'm not sure about the laws in Kenya and other countries, but in South Africa, it's very clear. Uh, you, you, you know, you, you can't you can't deal with the situation in, even inside the, the disciplinary sort of structures of the church without reporting it to the official uh, 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 bodies that that deal with this. Um, so I think for pastors, number one is just just learn what, what, what does the law say. I mean, just go and find out what. What is actually the laws? So let's stick to the law, number one. But then also, let's let's decide how would Jesus deal with child who is abused? Will he will he protect the abuser? You know, let's put ourselves in the in the in the play in, in the sort of the shoes of the child standing in front of Jesus having been abused, and then take responsibility. Uh, it is it is it's a discussion that needs to be opened in churches very widely, very widely. But we have to we have to. The law it's as, as simple as that thank you um, Taren, you're welcome i'm going to give you a, an additional question after your response just the last one from idolet and Dirk, they've asked about the stop model we will conclude with those two idolet says um, just comment on the correlation between the wounded child and the wounded parent but you first wanted to comment on people with influence and information yes. about abuse so um, the first comment, I'll, I'll answer that question, thank you, Idolette, but the first comment I just wanted to make is have, um, for pastors and leaders, do yourself a favor and have reporting policies and procedures. So when you sign people up in kids ministry or in the counseling space, have a very clear reporting procedure, um, because that also makes people feel safe enough to be able to do something about it. And it also means there's accountability. So if more than one person know about it, now you have to actually do something about it, whether you're scared or not. And the other thing is, um, I know um, in the, the most recent children's ministry I was a part of, we needed to, and I should know this because I'm a social worker, but complete, I think it's a form, oh, I can't remember the name of the form, but it's um, basically to check if your name is on the sexual offenses register. That should be a bare minimum, and it actually is a requirement if you're working with children that you have a form clearing you to say that your name is not on the sexual offences register. We can Google that because my brain is pregnancy broken. Apologies, and then um, or even a, a police clearance. Um, but we need to clear the people that that we are um, that are working with directly with children. I believe because that's also about accountable um, work with children. And then to address Idalit's question, wow. So I, I hope that as I've been talking, I have mentioned enough that we need to start with ourselves and practice these skills on ourselves. If we are not okay with our feelings, we communicate to our children through our behavior that we are not okay with their feelings and they, they don't have the right to feel them. If we aren't able to recognize um, ourselves as being worthy enough of love, we communicate that to our children and so we um when we're walking with world, wounded children it's easy to pass on our woundedness but I, f I do believe that as long as we are on a journey of healing we don't have to be afraid of our woundedness touching them because um the most important thing we can do in walking with children is to model what we hope for them in the future and so part of that modeling is just practicing the skills towards growth that we are hopeful of, even if we don't have it 100% right in the first place. But yes, there's definitely a correlation between woundedness causing wounding. Um, and healing also causes healing. <laughs> it's contagious. So when we sign up to healing, we're signing up to pass that on to the children that follow us. Thank you so much, so much, Taryn. Lisa, may I ask you to just to I browse through the questions to see if there's one last one that I have skipped. Obviously, we couldn't get all of them. Dirk, 
Um, Bev reminds you of the stock model. She has found that helpful. Just a comment she asks from your teaching. Do you still use it? And if so, would you briefly just refer or a comment? Yeah, thanks, Bev. It's nice to see your your name there. Um, yeah, the stock model. Uh, Phyllis Kilborn is a psychologist and uh, focusing on children in war situations or children that go through this extreme trauma. And she and the team they developed a, a very simple model that they call the stop sign model, and uh, and it's just an acronym. The S says that if a child, let's say they were been working with children in Liberia in the war, they said if you want to help this child to to move towards healing, there are just four things that need to be in place. If you if, if those things are not in place, you are always going to circle back into into a, a, a sort of situation of chaos inside the child. All right. So the first one structure. You have to create a, an environment where the child feels safe with structure. Uh, because if the child has to create their own structure, then they cannot deal with with the, with the chaos inside. The second thing is is uh, let's walk through the STOP. The second one was uh, time and talk. Healing takes time, and the talking must be done by the child. Not I'm not going to to heal the child by child by talking, and the the child must talk, and it's going to take time. The third one they used they used the O for they they described it as organized play now that is what Taryn is doing she is actually organizing a room in which the children can come and express themselves through play so that's what organized means it's not organizing a soccer game it's not organizing monopoly it's organizing a space where the child can express themselves through play and then the p is parental care it's just finding an, a reliable adult with whom the child can uh, can attach uh, because that attachment is going to help in the healing process. So it's very simple, very, very, very uh, um, um, helpful to read the books by Phyllis Kilborn. You can just click Google her. She wrote many, many different books with, with uh, other co-authors. Thank you so much. Um, it is time to wrap up. And Dirk, at the end, we have invited you to close in a word of prayer, which, which is exceptional, but Dirk, you've You've trained people in so many places and you've blessed us, so it might be appropriate. Taron, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for bringing your passion and your skill. I'm sure you would get some uh, response, some requests, some asking for advice. So maybe if via Cornelia people can reach you and ask for follow-up, maybe um, information, I'm, I'm sure you would at some point when baby is settled and starts playing, then you would be ready to, to answer. Thank you very much. May the Lord bless you, your family, and this little one. Dirk, thank you so much for another round with, with Sats and for sharing what God has entrusted to you. Actually, we want to pray for you, but today it's your opportunity to just bless Taryn and your audience in the name of the Lord who taught us what is healing and freedom and growth. Over to you. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you very much to both. Thank you. Uh, Lord Jesus, <laughs> Just being in your presence in this meeting, because we know we are we are meeting in your name, and and thinking of how you came to expose the heart of God in the way that you dealt with people. You showed us the anger of God at the injustice and the and the abuse of of widows of of women that are in a, in, a, in a position of no no power of of the poor and certainly of children. Uh, you showed us the deep, deep compassion that you have. And then uh, when you left, you said you're going to leave a comforter. And we have the comforter with us. And we know this comforter is the one that will stand up and fight for the right of, uh, rights of the children inside the church and inside the world. And we are giving ourselves to you, Holy Spirit, who is fighting, who is comforting, who is protecting, who is making us grow, who is healing. We're just giving ourselves as a body, the body of Jesus, to say, use us, use our ears, use our eyes, use our hands, use our toys, so that we can become part of a big, big healing movement, something that this world needs so much. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray this. Please bless every single participant. Please bless uh, Taryn and everything that she is still going to do with her own children and the children uh, in her community and with her, all the others involved with children. Bless them in your name, Jesus. Amen.